I'm Lisa Bedford and I'm the Survival Mom. Today I wanted to share with you a really important principle that is over 100 years old that has so many applications to survival and preparedness. And this principle is called the Pareto Principle, named after a man named Wilfred Pareto, who was an Italian economist. And according to Wikipedia, uh, Pareto had observed in his garden that 20% of all the pea plants that he had there produced 80% of the actual peas. And when he was researching as an economist, he realized that 80% of all the land in Italy belonged to just 20% of the people. And Pareto's principle is also called the 80-20 rule. And over and over again, I have seen how it applies to many areas of my life. Something as simple as the clothes in my closet. Out of all the clothes that are there, I wear probably 20%. I wear 20% of them about 80% of the time. That means that there is, gosh, a good chunk of clothes in my closet that I could probably get rid of. When I was a teacher and a trainer, um, it was obvious that in classroom settings, about 80% of the problems were caused by 20% of the students. And so over and over again, I have seen how this is applied. But when I'm thinking about preparedness and I'm thinking about family survival topics, it also applies there. So I wanted to spend just a few minutes talking about how to apply the Pareto Principle or the 80-20 rule to five different areas. The first is going to be applying it to people. The second is applying it to the skills and the knowledge that we have and want to learn. The third area is applying the 80-20 rule to supplies. The fourth area is applying it to food. And then finally, some ways of applying it to our home base. So let's start off with people. A lot of times, preppers and survivalists have an idea in mind that they are going to be put to, putting together the ideal survival community. And it's going to be made up of a dentist, and it's going to be made up of a doctor, and, uh, you know, a couple people who have military experience, and it's just all going to be, it's just going to run like clockwork. But I've got to tell you, the 80-20 rule applies to people. And I would bet that right now you can think of an example, maybe an example from a committee that you're on, or a church organization, or uh, the HOA in your neighborhood, uh, that about 20% of the people do most of the work. When it comes to complaining, when it comes to uh, being disgruntled, about 20% of the people are going to cause 80% of the conflict. I think you can count on that. This no bit of knowledge, I think, is really important when you're looking at connecting with other people and, you know, possibly buying some property together or you're making plans to bug out together, whatever the case might be, I think you can count on a small number of people doing most of the work. But the flip side of that, too, is that a small number of people will be the key decision makers. And that is something interesting to keep in mind, too. Will a key decision maker be one of the 80% who doesn't do much or one of the 80% who causes the problem? A lot of food for thought here, and only you know the personalities involved in your own family, your own community, and the connections that you have made and want to make to uh, have a more secure future. The second uh, place I'd like to apply the 80-20 rule has to do with skills. Right now, if you think about it, I would bet that about 20% of the skills you have, you rely on most often. Regardless of your job, if you're a computer programmer, you probably go back over and over again to 80%, excuse me, 20% of what you know. My husband is an electrical contractor, and I'll have to ask him this question, but I would bet that all the, uh, the tools and the supplies that he uses and the knowledge he has comes down to that 80-20 breakdown. So what does that mean? I think it means that it's important to identify the 20% of your knowledge base, the 20% of your skill base that is the most important, that will affect 80% of your survival. So for you, if gardening is one of those key skills, 
then perhaps that is the skill that you need to t focus on and enhance your own skills and your own learning level, but then also make sure you pass it on to other people. I read a book by Les Stroud a couple of years ago, and in this book, he told the story of numerous survival, real, true, real life survival stories. You know, the kind that are on, I shouldn't be alive. And in one of the stories, he told just uh, a hair about a harrowing episode of a family, a mother, father, two children, and then a, uh, a hired helper that were stranded at sea for weeks upon weeks. And for some reason, the dad had it in his head that only he did all the navigation and only he caught the fish and cleaned the fish. He was the only one with truly life-saving knowledge, and he refused to share it. That family was lucky that he wasn't washed overboard or died some other horrific death because no one else knew how to do those things. In a survival setting, we can't allow that to happen. The most important things you know, the most important knowledge you have, the skills you have, um, as well as those around you, those are the key skills to pass on to others. I don't think it's that important to know how to give haircuts, for example. That would not be in the 20% skills that I would identify as being most important. Might come in handy, you know, but hey, you know, with a pair of scissors, you know, anybody can become a barber, right? But it's important to identify the ones that are truly, will make the difference between life and death. So, Assess the skills and then pass on those that are most important first. The third area that this rule can apply to has to do with supplies. Now, I'm going to ask you, think about the tools that you have in your garage, the tools that you have in your toolbox, uh, what you have in your camping supplies, what you have in your hunting tools and hunting supplies. And I would bet that about 20% of those you use 80% of the time. So now here's an interesting um, mental exercise. Once you identify that 20%, those are the tools, those are the supplies that you must have your backups and then your double backups. We talk about the rule of three. Why apply the rule of three to some obscure chisel that you used one time eight and a half years ago? You want to apply that rule of three first to the supplies, to the tools that are most important, the ones that you reach for over and over again. And if you think about it, if you're always reaching for the same K-bar knife, if you're always reaching for the same Phillips uh, style of Phillips screwdriver, for example, you need to have backups of that in particular because just based on wear and tear. And so you don't want your favorite hunting knife or your favorite, um, you know, piece of camping equipment to, uh, to break and then not have a backup for that because you were focused on maybe getting backups for some obscure things that are rarely used. The fourth category is food storage. And I'm going to bring this down to um, recipes, even a recipe that uh, is as simple as a bean burrito or a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. And if you know me, you know that I do not like to cook. I am not a, a gourmet cook by any means. So in my family, you know, if I say that we're having sandwiches for dinner, it's pretty much sandwiches for dinner. It's nothing uh, lavish, that's for sure. But if you think about all the recipes that you know, including those that are most simple, you probably make 20% of those 80% of the time. So it makes sense when you're grocery shopping, it makes sense when you're buying food for food storage, that you first have those 20% uh, recipes covered with ingredients. If your family is a big sandwich eating family, for example, and your kids are eating sandwiches, you know, five or six days out of the week, it makes sense to stock up on wheat. It makes sense to stock up on uh, all of the bread ingredients. It makes sense to learn how to make bread and have uh, a couple of different ways of baking it should the power go out. Um, but also, it would make a lot of sense to have ingredients to make homemade mayonnaise, homemade ketchup, uh, whatever the foods are that you eat most frequently. And it's not just buying individual ingredients. It's also having that backup out in the garden or backing up by dehydrating or canning food. Finally, how do you apply the 80-20 rule to your home? 
there are lots of different ways of doing that, but I'm going to bring up appliances because in the average American home, even though you know people who live fairly rustic lives, we have small things and large things that uh, we rely on. And when I was thinking about the appliances that are most vital to my family, at the top of the list is the washing machine. We could live without the blender. We could live without a toaster. Um, we could live without the microwave, the dishwasher. We've lived without all of those things before we could do it again. But the washing machine is the one that would create, not having one, would be that would create the biggest workload for all of us, and I think the most inconvenience. So start with the appliances around your house that are either life-saving or that will mean the most to you uh, that you use most often right now. And those are the ones that you need to have a backup plan for, or even perhaps an actual, um, um, literally a backup. So for example, for my washing machine, maybe I want to make sure that I have some way to uh, maybe even have a more primitive version of a washing machine, just an agitator, a ringer, and then just plan on hanging the clothes up to dry. I did that years ago. I was staying in Scotland with a friend, and for whatever reason, it was modern times, but she had the weirdest contraption for a washing machine I'd ever seen. We had to boil the water on the stove, then we had to pour the water into this contraption. Everything was, you know, people powered. And when she said today was laundry day, that's what she meant. We did laundry all day because we could only wash, you know, four or five items at a time. And so it wasn't something she wanted to tackle, you know, more than once a week. Whatever those appliances are. Now let me just go out and branch off to a, on a slightly different uh, tangent. And that is anything in your home that is literally saving a life. If you have someone in your home who has, is on home dialysis, if you have someone who is reliant on a, uh, a drug that has to be refrigerated, those types of appliances would go to the top of your list, You're that 20%. And when you think about those, it might be time to look at um, a solar powered generator or a different kinds of generator that uses, you know, there are various uh, different fuels out there that can be stored to power, you know, different kinds of generators. Um, but you don't want to go without a period of time without power, either because it is so expensive that you're having to cut corners elsewhere just to have that appliance going, just to have that life-saving piece of medical equipment going in order to keep someone alive, a loved one. So that uh, maybe that criteria can help you narrow down to in your home what are the most important things that you have to have that will make the biggest difference to um, the way that you live. And another part of just, you know, applying the rule to your home has to do with your garden. Take a look at your garden. Is there about 20% of the plants out there that uh, are providing the most useful type of produce? Maybe that is what you need to expand upon. We've been growing Thai basil, and as much as I love the smell of Thai basil, I don't think I have any recipes that call for Thai basil. And, um, Sometimes it's just nice to go out there and just pick some Thai basil and just smell it. But push come to shove, I could tear out that those Thai basil plants and I could put something in that we would actually have more use for. So that is the 80-20 rule in action applied to survival and preparedness. Um, this segment is also covered in a class, a webinar that I teach called Five Survival Principles You Can't Afford to Ignore. And you can look for that on my webinar schedule, which is actually on my blog, thesurvivalmom.com. You can follow me on Facebook and Twitter, which are updated on a regular basis. Thanks for your time, and I will catch you next time around.